Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Is that loud enough? <clears throat> Welcome. I hope everybody appreciated and enjoyed and made like really productive use of your extra hour. Whether you got a little extra sleep, whether you got to eat a bigger breakfast, whether you, uh, I don't know, stayed up later, all of that works. Um, I think we did a little bit of everything. So it's nice to, the, the silver lining is that we get an extra hour for one day. The downside is that for the next, what, six months, it's going to be dark at three in the afternoon. So enjoy the darkness. Uh, be the light in the darkness. The Bible says we are the salt and the light. So you've been being the salt. Now you got to be the light starting at 3 p.m. So let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the changes of the season, Lord God, as we see your authority and your design in everything around us. The scripture says that your creation sings your glory, that your creation is evidence of you. And we see it and we feel it even more, Lord God. We come together to just directly commune with you in your house here today, this morning, Lord. We just ask that your spirit be all around us. And Heavenly Father, that you just cover us with your mercy, your grace, your love, your healing power, Lord God. We, we pray, Lord Jesus, this, this just be a time of complete intimacy and communion with your spirit. We ask that you anoint this service and bless each and every one gathered here this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, feel free to stand if you'd like. Lord God, I thank you, Jesus, for this day, Father. Thank you, Lord God, that you've given each and every one of us, Lord, a voice to worship you with. Lord God, you've given us a heart for you, Lord God, and we would be so honored if you would join us this morning in a tangible way, Lord, that we can experience your presence this morning, Lord. We need you, Father. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. He touched me. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name, God.
our, our, our worries and our cares, Lord God, and we lay them at your feet. Thank you for your mighty grace. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Praise your name.
Audrey, just before you sing this next song, Audrey sent me the song list days and days ago. I think I don't remember what day it was for this, for this day, and I didn't look at it. I didn't open it until last night about 11.30. I opened it and I looked at it and I saw this song. And I know that there are words in here that sound so final and so harsh almost. But listen to the message. We talked last week about Elijah being on the mountain and God sent the, the uh, wind and God wasn't in the wind and he sent the earthquake and he wasn't in the earthquake and the fire and he wasn't in the fire. But the still small voice is where God's power was and Elijah recognized it and knew it was God by the voice. This morning, this song says, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. I'm glad the kids are here. They, I know, have never heard this in their whole life, but it will sink deep, and it has such a message.
forgiveness. We want to thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that your love, Lord God, covers a multitude of sins. We thank you, Jesus, that you, Lord, are willing, Lord God, to lay your own life down for us. And Lord God, all you ask of us is to worship you, to praise you, have a relationship with you, Lord, to just connect with you, Lord, to love you, to love you back, Father. We love you back, Father. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. You, my Lord. I love you, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. tell a quick uh, story while they do that. Um, I told Audrey this morning on the way to church, uh, guess what I watched last night? Um, I, had, I had made a note when going by a church on, I don't recognize the denomination necessarily, uh, and you know it has all the rainbow flag and stuff out front that says all are welcome and included and so I, I was just curious, what is a service like at, at that church? And I'll save you the time, but um, it's surprisingly stale. It's not Sodom and Gomorrah like I might have expected. It's just folks that look like they go to church, maybe a few that don't, but and they feel like they're doing church, and they read, you know, something not necessarily scripture, but something akin to scripture. They all read it together. Um, it's really like an hour of announcements by different people just coming up and reading a piece of poetry or showing a piece of art. The saddest thing about it is they, they speak of, of contacting God as though God is so distant and that we should be lucky enough just to look in nature and maybe see a glimpse of God in nature. Um, there is no power because there is no close contact with God, um, which is sad. But you understand then, without that presence, that regular intimate communion with God, anything can creep in. I mean... It's just a matter of wanting to avoid conflict, and that's what they've done in many churches. I mean, that's just one. I don't need to pick on just one. There's, you can drive around and see just in, the, in Campbell and San Jose, there's dozens. You want to avoid conflict with the world, and when somebody comes in and needs deliverance from something oppressive and evil, what are you going to do? You can't do anything. God's not there. There's no power. There's no closeness. There's no even, you know... A simple understanding of the scripture ought to have dispelled a lot of these mistakes, mistaken assumptions, or whatever it is. Um, but here are these churches that have existed in denominations for hundreds of years find themselves not knowing how to touch God. The pastor of the church, she, she said, let's breathe. Let's all breathe together and breathe in God. And they... Take a breath and, and move on. It's just, I thought, man, 
here's a building, here's a group of people, they look like nice people. You know, they look like sweet people that would go to church and there's nothing there. There's, there's no contact, there's no even hope of it. The pastor's leading and saying, we should be so lucky in our lifetimes to have a moment where we feel something that might be greater than us. And we believe that's God. We believe that's God. <laughs> I just thought, oh, God, I, you know, I had a different perspective after seeing that than I did just driving by, which was much more, uh, I'd say, oh, man, what a, what a, you know, what a crazy nightmare it must be in there. It's just empty. It's just, it's just empty um, and every one of those and, you know there's not a lot of people in there um, you know it's churches generally are not drawing a lot of people or as many people right now as they have in years past but when it's time and when things and things are obviously getting sketchy around us that's not a place anyone can go for help there's nothing there to save them there's nothing anyone in there can do to heal them, to save them, to, de to deliver them. It's just empty. In contrast to that today, we're going to take communion. And we're going to commune with our Savior. And, um, and this is all about intimacy. This is all about obedience, devotion, and a recognition of what our Savior did on Calvary for us. You could do this every day, and it wouldn't be too much to recognize his sacrifice for us. So I think we were all served. Um, Audrey, would you mind praying over the, the bread and body of Christ? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Jesus, that you just didn't forsake everybody, Lord. That you were willing to lay down your life for your friends. And that you were, that you are still interceding and mediating for us right now at the right hand of the Father. That you've never left us orphaned or abandoned. We thank you, Jesus, um, that you're alive and that you are, um, you're the great I am. And you love us so tenderly and so perfectly and so lord god we just thank you for your for what you you are doing currently and what you did for us at the cross thank you jesus amen amen mighty god we are so grateful that we have the blessed opportunity to come face to face with you and to take part in communion and recognition of your sacrifice. This, this cup of juice represents, it's representative of the blood that you spilled on Calvary, that atoning blood. That blood, when we put our faith in you and we say we believe Jesus, you are the son of God and you died for our sins. You shed your blood on the cross and you rose again in victory over death and the grave. That blood is atoning for our sins for all time. And when the father looks upon us, he sees the blood of his son covering our sins and he doesn't see our sins. They're gone. They're washed away forever. That is the power of this blood. And we don't need to walk forward in a church and receive this sacrament from a man and kiss a ring and, and do all the rest. Lord, we come to you personally. Each and every one of us in this building comes to you personally, face to face, one on one. There's nothing needed between man and God, but our Christ and Savior, our mediator, the Holy One. We take this cup of juice, Lord God, in recognition of your sacrifice, your atoning blood, the powerful blood that washes away all of our sins so that we get to spend an eternity with you in glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your presence here today, your blessed 
assurance, Heavenly Father, that with this faith, the power of your blood, we have all hope for all eternity in you. And we have trials and tribulations, as the word says, that we will in this life, but we have a blessed hope of your blessed return, of you gathering up your people unto yourself, of us ruling and reigning with you as kings and priests under you, Lord God, and an eternity in your presence. We can't wait, Jesus. We can't wait. We ask your anointing, Lord, over the remainder of this service, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, I want to talk about two yolks, not jokes, yolks, and not eggs, but other yolks. I know, that was a bad pun. Two yolks. <laughs> We're going to read an illustrated sermon of sorts this morning, and we have a lot of scripture to cover, so bear with me. We're going to be in Jeremiah, so if you want to turn to Jeremiah chapter 27, that's where we're going to start. And I cannot tell you how grateful and thankful that I am for the songs, the messages in the songs, and the message that's coming forth this morning, because God, once again, as the great orchestrator, he orchestrated it all. Father, I just ask your blessing upon this message that it would be for our growth and our further understanding, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Reading verse 1. This message came to Jeremiah from the Lord early in the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord said to me. Make a yoke and fasten it on your neck with leather thongs. Then send messages to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon through their ambassadors who have come to see King Zedekiah in Jerusalem. Give them this message for their masters. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. With my great strength and powerful arm, I made the earth and all its people and every animal. I can give these things of mine to anyone I choose. Now I will give your countries to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who is my servant. Pay attention to those words. I have put everything, even the wild animals, under his control. All the nations will serve him, his son, and his grandson until his time is up. Then many nations and great kings will conquer and rule over Babylon. So you must submit to Babylon's king and serve him and put your neck under Babylon's yoke. I will punish any nation that refuses to be his slave, says the Lord. I will send war, famine, disease upon that nation until Babylon has conquered it. Do not listen, verse 9, do not listen to your false prophets, fortune tellers, interpreters of dreams, mediums, and sorcerers who say, the king of Babylon will not conquer you. They are all liars, and their lies will lead to your being driven out of your land. I will drive you out and send you far away to die. Wow. Verse 11. But the people of any nation that submits to the king of Babylon will be allowed to stay in their own country, to farm the land as usual, and I, the Lord, have spoken this. Did he ever? 
My goodness. God chose the most unusual way to punish the people of Judah in this instance. His appointed foreign servant, King Nebuchadnezzar, not a Jew, he was not appointed to proclaim God's message, but to fulfill God's promise of judgment for sin. Because God is in control, as we just read, of everything and all events in history. He uses whatever and whomever he wants to, even unlikely circumstances, like putting a yoke of servitude on the people and choosing a non-Israelite, a foreign king. Nebuchadnezzar's conquest had built his empire to a major, powerful force which God needed in his plan. Moving on, Jeremiah chapter 28. You don't have to turn that. Well, actually, yeah, we're going to read two scripture there. The next chapter over, 28, goes on to tell what happened. Hananiah, whom the Bible identifies as a false prophet, told them exactly the opposite of what God had said. He physically broke off the yoke that God had told Jeremiah to put around his neck and tie it with the leather thongs. And he told the people, you will not be invaded by nor be subject to the king of Babylon, but God will surely break off that yoke from you. We're going to read verse 15 in chapter 28, 16 and 17. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to Hananiah, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but the people have believed your lies. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, You must die. Your life will end this very year because you have rebelled against the Lord. Two months later, the prophet Hananiah died. Some yokes cannot be broken without the power of God. And there is another yoke that can only be broken by God. Now, if you would turn to Isaiah 10, verse 27. And it shall come to pass in that day, the day of the Lord, which refers to the final battle between the Antichrist and Jesus Christ, the Messiah. In that day that this burden, Antichrist burden, shall be taken away from off thy shoulders and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be broken or destroyed because of the anointing. Did you read that? Because of the anointing, Jesus Christ will break off the yoke that Antichrist, even the spirit of Antichrist, which we see now prevalent among us, will be broken off the people. Isaiah prophesied that in that day, it will be the anointing that breaks the yoke. Several commentaries I read said that the translation of the Hebrew word there of, for anointing, shemen, actually means the anointing oil. So the oil poured upon Jesus Christ, he will break the yoke of the Antichrist. And no longer will God's people be burdened by or yoked to sin or evil, nor will those who want to annihilate God's people, whether we're talking about Jews in Israel or whether we're talking about us grafted in ones into the bloodline of Christ, doesn't make any difference. Antichrist wants to annihilate all of us who belong to God. 
He will have no more power over them, for because of the anointing, God gave the church the anointing through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have that anointing oil in the Lord to break that power. Can you stand just a little bit more reading of the word? I hope you can, because I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. Because this is where the rhema of the word is. This is what started it all. This is where the Lord woke me up early one morning this week with these words. Take my yoke upon you. Oh, what an invitation. And we've heard invitation this morning in every song that we sang to take his yoke upon us. Verse 28. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden that I give you is light. Amen. We've read how oppressive and how heavy a yoke of sin, a yoke of oppression from others can be. But do you know what yokes were created to do? They were created to distribute the weight across the animals evenly so that no one animal had to bear the whole weight by themselves selves, or pull the whole load alone. But the yoke went across the neck and it was even custom built for the animal so that it would sit perfectly upon them and distribute the weight across the load. So the yoke was a good thing for them unless they rebelled under the, under the yoke. In the Jeremiah prophecy, had the Israelites just done what God said and be subject to the yoke of King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he would have, they would have fared fairly well. He told them, you will plant as usual. You will eat as usual. You will be normal and I will be with you and bless you. But they would not. Now, make no mistake. Nebuchadnezzar was not a hero. He was not a, a staunch believer in God. But even under this yoke, God had a plan to bless the people through him. Many people wonder how a man in our day and age who is not a you know, traditional Christian man as we would recognize, how could he be the one? Well, look here. Nebuchadnezzar was not a godly man, but he was God's chosen man for the hour. Israel has been under the yokes of so many evil and wicked uh, people. Instead of them being easier to bear the load, they were oppressed, but it was because of their own rebellion, their own idolatry and sin, and also because of the demands of greedy and oppressive religious leaders over them and because of their weariness in searching for God. They've allowed themselves to be horribly abused and misused as they still are today. I'm telling you one thing. I am praying for Benjamin Netanyahu. I know this man has a relationship with historical 
Jesus, uh, God, not Jesus, of course, I don't think, but definitely historical Jewish traditional God, and that God spoke to these people. He still speaks to them today and draws them. The song we said say, sang says that Jesus is standing on the portals, looking and waiting and watching for you and for me to come home. This is what I am praying for Benjamin Netanyahu, to fall on his face at an altar before God and say, I haven't done it all right. Yes, I've let others oppress and move in and buy me or whatever, but God, I want to hear your voice, and I want others. I thank the Lord. If you've been watching in our House of uh, Representatives, the miracle that took place, I believe, last week when, I forgot his name, Mike Johnson, Mike Johnson, out of the blue, was voted in almost 100%, I think there was one person that wasn't there that day, to be the Speaker of the House. He is a staunch Bible-believing, uh, scripture-quoting saint of God. Everything I have heard the man say is of wisdom, and I, I looked up a lot of what he has to say. And he is a man of truth, and I, I think we are blessed by having him in this position. I'm getting close to the end. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to read a few more verses. This, power, this passage is also talking about the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, the man of perdition or destruction. These are all names for Antichrist. And Paul writes these words. And now we know what is holding him back, for he cannot be revealed until his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secretly until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with the splendor of his coming. He is coming soon, people. The anointing, the breath out of Jesus' mouth will destroy the Antichrist. Just a couple more. Well, if I can turn the page. In 2 Kings 4, you don't have to turn there. A very poor widow woman. Now, last week we talked about Elijah ministering to the widow woman there. But this week we're talking about Elisha, who had a second, or excuse me, a double portion of the anointing that Elijah had. And Elijah said to this woman who came to him for help, he said, woman, what do you have in your house? And she said, nothing but a little bottle of oil. And Elijah said, okay, here's what you're going to do. You can get involved in your own blessing. And you and your sons go out and you borrow every vessel you can find. And you bring them back to your house. He said, then you go in and you shut the door. Do you know why he said shut the door? Because there were those who were discrediting her. There were those who were, she had creditors coming to her who were going to steal her sons as payment for her debt that she couldn't pay. 
And Elisha said, close the door, shut out the noise, shut out all of the doubters and all the fear, just close the door. And then take your little bottle and start filling vessels. She poured and poured and poured out of that little bottle until the vessel was full. One son would pick it up and move it over. The other would, this is conjecture, but you can see it happening. The other one would put the other bottle in front. And she's still pouring until every one of them were completely full. And the Bible said that's when her little vessel ran dry. And Elisha said, now you go sell some oil, pay your debt, and you will live off the rest of the oil all through the drought until it's over. I want to say two things here. One, about children's participation in this miracle. I want to read one very short scripture. This is not because I think we need to be mean to kids. Don't misunderstand this. Lamentations 3, 27. I adore my grandkids, and I think they're being raised so beautifully. Lamentations 3, 27 says these words. It is good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of his discipline. So yokes can be good for us. The yoke of discipline doesn't feel good, but it's good for us in our lives. Children need responsibilities that teach them from an early age how to be reliable and responsible and dependable and useful in God's kingdom. And lastly, do you feel like you have a yoke on your neck that's not good for you, that's causing you harm, that isn't distributing weight evenly across you, but it's hurting you? Maybe we need to listen to Jesus' words that said, come to him and take his yoke upon us. Maybe you have a yoke of financial problems or doubt or fear or illness or any number of things that you feel trapped underneath. God told Jeremiah, put the yoke on you. I'm telling you to put it on you as a symbol and a show, a sign for other people to see it. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, but others can see it. Others can know that you are yoked to him. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, talking about lifted up on a cross, yes, I will draw all men to me. But when we stand in our service and we raise our hands, and I'll tell you something, I love it when I hear noses being blown. I just think that's the greatest thing. It's hard to do that and play the piano at the same time, but I love to hear it when I, when I hear people blowing their nose because I know that they're reaching out and they're lifting up Jesus because he says, with my breath, I will break that yoke. I will break that bondage off of you if you come to him. Now I'm done. Would you stand with me, please? And don't forget in that final day, he will destroy the destroyer. Been putting on their heart. What is the last thing the Lord told you? And Claire said, he kept repeating, take my yoke upon me, uh, on, upon you, and my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So just, he'd been repeating that to Claire for the last month or so. So beautiful. Such a, such a powerful thing when God puts things together, yep. like he said, orchestrating things. Yep. 1 Peter 5, 
6 and 7 says, If we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he will exalt us at the proper time. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Father, we thank you so for the breath of the anointing of Jesus that breaks every yoke of sin, that breaks every yoke of bondage that would be put on our lives. Oh, God, I pray that that breath would be blown over Israel. God, that you would shoot that breath out over them. Lord, that the, tr the droplets of your breath would trickle down over them and they would come to know you as Messiah through all of this torment that they're under, O oh God. And all people, Lord, would come to you. And we, Lord Jesus, here, we feel isolated and maybe even uh, set apart from all of that. Oh, but no, because we are in the body of Christ, we bear the burden with them. But Lord, we bear the burden only in prayer and we lift them up to you today, Jesus. And oh God, I pray anyone, anyone under the sound of our voice today, Lord, who doesn't know you as their personal savior, would heed your call to come unto you. That they would relinquish sin, not that they're bad people, oh God, that's not our intent, but that your yoke can be exchanged for the heaviness of sin and the heaviness of this world and that we would wear it with joy. Oh, Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your precious, precious spirit. And I pray that you would go with each one of us today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.